Hi, I'm Nicholas Dwork, and today we're going to be talking about Machines That Learn, an Introduction to Neural Networks. There are sophisticated things that we want our computers to do. We might want them to recognize speech and convert it into text. We might want them to recognize objects and images. Or we might want them to choose video recommendations on a website. Conventional techniques would go as follows. We would identify features that represent the relevant part of the data. And then we would somehow embed those features as representations in our computer program. Anytime we got a new data set, we'd search through the data set looking for those features that we had previously created. So what might those representations look like in our three examples? Well, for speech, we'd have to find a ah, and e eh, and k and a eh, and all other sounds said by all other accents by everyone. For recognizing objects and images, we'd have to figure out what a cat looks like in all different poses, in all different lighting conditions, at all different distances. And then do the same thing for a ball, a dog, a mountain, and everything else. And for video recommendations, we'd need to somehow figure out representations of users' minds, and then embed those representations of all users into the computer. Well, this turned out to be very hard, and these methods did not work well. You could sort of feel how overwhelming they are. This leads us to machine learning. And the key to machine learning is asking the question, what if we had a lot of data to work with? For our three examples, that would mean a lot of recordings of sounds, a lot of labeled images, or a lot of selected videos by users. Can we leverage the information in these data sets to find a good answer? And so here's what the new technique becomes. We are going to make a mathematical function with many parameters. And we will use the data to figure out what good values for those parameters might be. So let's talk about parameters for a second. Here's the familiar equation for a line. It has a slope m and a y-intercept b. And if the slope is 1 and the y-intercept is 0, we get this line. And if the slope is negative 2 and the y-intercept is 0, we get this line. And if the slope is 0 and the y-intercept is negative 3, we get this line. So we see that by choosing different slopes and y-intercepts, we get different lines. And so the slope and y-intercept are parameters of our function. They're parameters of a straight line. And I'll denote the parameters in the subscript notation here. All right, so now we sort of understand what a parameter is, and we'll see that we want to change the parameters to get the function that best fits our data. Now we have the question, what function should we use? And for that, we turn to biology for inspiration. Let's talk about a neuron. Here's a picture of one, and it's got different parts. This tree structure at the left end is called the dendrites. This long portion here is called the axon. And the tree structure at the right end is called the synaptic terminals. A neuron is like a biological wire. It transmits a signal from the dendrites through the axon to the synaptic terminals. Neurons are often arranged in a chain, as shown here. And what will happen is, the action potential will travel along the axon, which releases the neural transmitter. And as long as enough of that neural transmitter gets released, it causes the next neuron in the chain to also fire. So how can we use this to create a function for our machine learning algorithms? Well, we're going to have a bunch of inputs. This, these are like our dendrites. And we're going to weight each of those inputs. So x1 will get weighted by w1, x2 will get weighted by w2, etc. Then we're going to sum up all of those weighted values. So we're going to add x1 w1 to x2 w2 to x3 w3, etc. We're also going to add in some arbitrary scalar b. This structure here is called an adaptive combiner. And this is the expression. Now, you might recognize this, but a concise way of writing x1, w1, plus x2, w2, plus etc., plus xn, wn, is just x dot w. So the expression for an adaptive combiner is x dot w plus b. Now, we're not quite at a neuron. A key fact of a neuron is that without enough stimulation, the neuron doesn't transmit the signal. And so we need to add this to our adaptive combiner to create a simple model for a neuron. What we need is a function like this, where with very little stimulation shown on the x-axis, very little gets through the neuron shown on the y-axis. But with a lot of stimulation, then we get a lot coming out of the neuron. 
This function is called a sigmoid, and here is its expression. So here is our adaptive combiner from before. We add the sigmoid to the end of it, and we get our model for a neuron. And look, it even kind of looks like a neuron. So here is our mathematical expression for the neuron. We take the previous output of the adaptive combiner, x dot w plus b, and send it into the sigmoid function. OK, so we now have a function with a good number of parameters. But what now? How do we choose the values w's and b's so that our neuron does what we want? For this, we're going to use a type of math to teach the neuron called optimization. What if I told you that the function was always smooth? At any point, we can try and figure out which direction is down and move in that direction. This leads us to the concept of a derivative. A derivative is an arrow that points in the up direction. The size of the arrow is how fast the function is going up. So here's the function that I showed you previously, and let's talk about the derivative at this point. It's clearly moving up in the left direction, and it's moving up quickly. So this is our derivative, an arrow pointed left. How about this point? Well, we see that it's moving up in the right direction, but it's not moving up as fast as our previous slope. Here's our derivative here, an arrow pointed to the right that's not as big as our previous arrow. Here's our third point, and it's not moving as fast as even our previous point, so it gets the smallest arrow so far. Now here's a question. What size is the arrow at the bottom of our function? Hopefully you realize that the derivative at the bottom of the function is an arrow of size 0. Now if you know calculus, you might know how to calculate the derivative. But sometimes we don't have an expression for the function that we're trying to differentiate, or for other reasons we just can't take the derivative. So I'm going to explain dithering, a method for estimating the derivative. And here's how it goes. Here are the axes of our graph from before. And here's a point. We want to know the derivative at this point. What we do is we evaluate the function close to this point, And then we fit a line to both of those points. And now we see that the function is moving up to the left, and we know the slope of this line. So our arrow is pointed to the left. And the size of the arrow is the slope of the line. That's our estimate of the derivative. This leads us to an algorithm called derivative descent. We move in the direction opposite to the derivative, and we move an amount proportional to the derivative. And so this is what the expression looks like. Our next point, x nu, is equal to our current point, x, minus alpha times the derivative, f prime of x. Alpha is just our constant of proportionality. It's called the learning rate, and we get to choose it. So here's our function from before, and let's see how this works. Here's our first guess, let's say. The derivative points to the left. We're going to move a direction opposite to the derivative, so we're going to move to the right. Now we evaluate our function at this new point. That leads us to our second point here. Again, the derivative points to the left. That means we're going to move to the right. And we evaluate our function at this new point, and we're basically done. We found the bottom of our function. In multi-dimensions, it works similarly. Here is a 3D picture, a relief distortion map for a landmass, and let's talk about the derivative. Well, let's consider this point here. Remember, the derivative points in the direction that's moving up the fastest. And at this point, the derivative is in this direction. How about this point here? Again, the derivative points in the up direction, and we see it's moving up fastest to the left and perhaps slightly down, as shown here. But it's not moving as fast as our previous point, so the arrow is shorter. How about here? Well, here it's steepest of the three points so far, and it's steepest in this direction. So it gets the biggest arrow, and it's moving up fastest in the up and right direction. So in multi-dimensions, the analog of derivative descent is called gradient descent. The derivative in multi-dimensions is called the gradient. And again, it's similar to the derivative descent. It's very intuitive. We simply move in the direction opposite to the gradient, and we move an amount proportional to the gradient. This is what that expression looks like. The gradient of a function at a point x is denoted by this upside down triangle. So this expression says our new point x nu is equal to our old point x minus some learning rate alpha times the gradient of our function f at the point x. Note that if we were going to estimate the gradient using dithering, we now have to dither in each dimension or along each parameter. We have to dither along the first parameter and then the second parameter, then the third parameter, etc. This is why we love calculus. When we can, we want to avoid dithering to avoid that computational cost. Here's our expression of a neuron from before. 
The W and the B are the parameters. These are the knobs that we're going to get to tune in order to get our neuron to do what we want. In order to do that, though, we need a function that we're going to minimize. And here's the function. We're going to minimize the error. We're going to take the output of the neuron and subtract it from the output that we want. And then we're going to square those values. And we're going to do that for all the data that we have and sum up the answer. And through the minimization of that function, we can now set the weights of our neuron. Perhaps an example will make this more clear. Our example is the following. We're going to put an infrared camera in an airport, and we want the computer to alert us if it sees a gun hidden under somebody's shirt. In order to go through this example more clearly, we need to understand what an image is. So here's a 2D array. It's just a 2D grid of numbers. And I can show it to you like this, or I can show it to you in an equivalent way, where I'm going to take 0 and make it black, I'm going to take 255 and make it white, and I'm going to take every number in between and make it gray, where the numbers closer to 255 are brighter. Here's that representation. Note that the representation is equivalent. I can go from here back to the numbers, or I can go from the numbers back to these gray levels. There's no difference at all. Now I'm going to make a slightly larger array. Here it is. Again, I can always go back to the numbers, or I can just show you the gray levels. Now I'm going to make an even larger array. Larger still, larger still, larger still, largest. And you see what has happened. At some point, our eye is no longer able to discern the individual pixels. But it doesn't change the nature of an image. An image is just a 2D array that is displayed in an interesting way so that our brains can easily comprehend the information in the 2D array. And with modern displays, our eyes no longer distinguish the individual pixels. And what we can do with an image is we can take the first column of the image, and we can take the second column and put it below the first column, and we can take it the third column and put it below the second column, and we can turn our image into a giant column of numbers. And that's perfect for input into our neural network. Here's how we go about training the neural network. We start the weights and with the bias with some random value. The weights are the w's and the bias is b. And then we're going to input our first image. And we're going to get some output. And we're going to label the images. We want any picture with a gun to be a value of 1. And we want any picture without a gun to be a value of 0. So we're going to determine the error between our, what our neuron is putting out and the value 1 when we put in this image of a gun. Then we're going to do the same thing for a picture without a gun. We're going to take the output of our neuron, and we're going to determine the error. This time, y hat minus 0 squared is the error, because there's no gun in this picture. We're going to do the same thing for another picture of a person hiding a gun. We're going to take the output of our neuron. We're going to determine the error. Another picture without a gun, take the output, determine the error. And then we're going to sum up all of those errors for all of the data we have. We're going to find the gradient of that error function. And then we're going to update W and B using gradient descent. And we keep training with the data until the weights and biases stop changing much. When we are training, we say that the neuron is learning. That's what we mean by machine learning. Once we have the weights and the bias B, we input a picture that we haven't seen before, and we get some output from our neuron. And now we threshold. If our output is greater than 0.5, then we claim that our neuron has seen a gun. And if our output is less than 0.5, then we claim that our neuron hasn't seen a gun. And that's how we use the neuron once we've trained it. So there's a problem with what I've shown you so far. If we consider this giant block as our data, we often have way too much data to store in memory, or it takes way too long to compute all the costs to perform gradient descent. So what we do is chunk up our data into blocks called mini-batches. And for each batch, we determine the error, we find the gradient, and we update the parameters. And then we use the next batch. We determine the error, we find the gradient, we update the parameters. We use the next batch. We determine the error, we find the gradient, we update the parameters using gradient descent and so on and so on through all the mini-batches. And then we start again at the first batch, and we keep going until we feel like we've trained the weights. So we keep training the data until the weights and biases stop changing much. OK, so this will work OK. It'll work about 70% of the time. To increase the accuracy significantly, though, we need many more parameters. Again, we are inspired by biology. 
This is a neuron, and it worked pretty well. Well, if a neuron worked well, perhaps a brain, which is a bunch of neurons, will work better. So I'm going to change the representation of a neuron from this beautiful biological picture to a simple oval. But like before, we can always send in our input and accept our output. OK? So here's our neuron. I'm going to shrink it down. And like I said before, we could send our input to the single neuron. But now I'm going to make many more neurons. And I'm not just going to make one layer of neurons. I'm going to make a second layer. And why stop at two layers? Let's make a bunch of layers. And we could always take our input and send it to our initial neuron like before. But now we can take our input and send it to all the different neurons of the first layer. And we can take the output of the first layer and send it to all the neurons of the next layer. And in fact, we can do that for all the neurons in the first layer. And we can do that for all the neurons in all the layers. Finally, we take the outputs of all the neurons in the last layer and we send them to one final neuron. The output of that neuron is now called our estimate. So here we've got a bunch of neurons or a mini brain. This mini brain we refer to as a fully connected neural network. And like before, we're going to train this neural network. We're going to teach it. We're going to iterate over all the training data. And for each batch, we're going to determine the error. We're going to find the gradient. And we're going to update the parameters W and B using gradient descent. Note that in this neural network, there are different parameters for each neuron. And this works much better than a single neuron. If we got 70% with our single neuron, we might get 85 or 90% with this neural network. All right, so in summary, I've shown you what a neuron is. I've taught you how to teach it with gradient descent. And I've shown you how to improve your accuracy with neural networks. Thank you for your attention.